So, um, just so you're all in the right place. This is indeed um, introduction to hybrid logic, and uh, I'm Peter Clackburn. And as you can see, I work at the Department of Philosophy at Western University in Denmark. Um, yes. So I'm going to be talking to you about hybrid logic in this course, and. Let me just try and give you some kind of feel for where I'll be taking you or where I'll be trying to take you. You might actually say that what I'm really giving you is a course in modal logic. Um, yes, I know that in the title of the course it says hybrid logic, and perhaps some of you have heard of hybrid logic and have heard of it as something a little bit different from modal logic. Actually, even by the end of today's lecture, I want you to come firmly away with the idea that modal logic, hybrid logic, they belong together, they fit together, they're cousins, they're friends, and so on and so forth. Actually, partly for pedagog pedagogical purposes, and partly just to sort of instill a sense of drama, I'm first of all going to be starting off with modal logic and then destroying it, and then building up hybrid logic, just so we can sort of get a little bit of interaction and interest going on. Still, the takeaway message for today, and indeed for the course, is that this is part and part of modal logic. So in one way it is going to be an introduction to modal logic, but here's something interesting. Okay? Modal logic, perhaps the way you've been taught it, over the last 20, perhaps even 30 years, has become a very different subject from what, from what it once was. Could I just take a quick kind of poll about backgrounds of people? How many people here would describe themselves as predominantly linguists? How many people here would describe themselves as predominantly uh, computer scientists? Logicians? Philosophers? Okay, so fairly evenly matched. Now, if you've learned about modal logic in the philosophical tradition, and if, say, you've learned about modal logic in the computer science tradition, and indeed in the linguistics tradition, it's very, very likely you've come away with very different pictures of what modal logic actually is. Because the area has been exploding, and not, so to speak, exploding in a nice, neat direction, but branching furiously and going off in all sorts of exciting directions. Okay? Actually, in a sense, what I'm going to be talking to you about is bringing you modal logic and hybrid logic from a logical perspective, which in some sense is trying to tie them back together again and make them seem one. Actually, I would also say that uh, although I came up with this tradition, this very, very logical tradition, one of my present goals actually <coughs> is to take hybrid logic and so to speak, to take it home again, to bring it to bear on philosophical issues. But that's something that, we're, that I'm working on now. But there is this aim in this course about trying to bring together diverse strands and make them work together. Now, this is an introductory course and I don't want to assume too much logical background. I think I can sort of safely explain everything that's going on to everybody in this room. I've got a mixture of goals. One goal is pretty largely conceptual. It's to get you thinking about modal and hybrid logic, and actually, in a deeper sense, to get you thinking about logic, what it is and what it does. Okay. Because it's also an introductory course, I also think that in order to start doing logic, or I screwed that one up. In order to really learn logic, there is a sense in which you have to do logic. So I'm trying to sort of get across some kind of technical skills as well, or technical notions. And roughly speaking, you'll know what these are. There's two technical notions that are going to be the big ones underlying this course. But you'll hear what a bisimulation is later today. And in tomorrow's lecture, you'll be hearing a little bit about tableau proofs. And in a sense, these are the two technical themes that I'll be taking through. Uh, I guess you should, if you're not a logician or you're not used to logic, you should perhaps think of them as the sort of exercises you would have in a linguistics class of drawing, let's say, uh, phrase, phrase markers or something like that. Uh, they're the sort of thing that by actually thinking about them, doing them, you get a deeper feeling for the issues that are involved. But that's probably enough preamble. Let me give you, um, let me try and give you the, the listing of the, the lectures that I'm going to be doing. Today is, as I say, from modal logic to hybrid logic, 
And as I've already explained, it's really well from one part of modal logic to another part of modal logic, but let's dramatize the story along the way. Okay? Tomorrow I'm going to be talking about hybrid deduction, and you'll be learning about hybrid tableau and a few other systems. But we're just going to keep on going, hybridizing more, developing richer hybrid logics and finding other things to do with this. Lecture three, we go to a much stronger hybrid logic in which we can sort of, we can do logic locally, let's put it that way. Then I'm going to tell you about doing all this sort of stuff first on the logic. So here we start touching perhaps on more philosophical issues about how you deal with first order quantification in the modal setting. And on the last lecture, lecture five, it's going to be predominantly historical. I want to go back to the roots of hybrid logic and tell you a story about a certain logician called Arthur Pryor, who came from an interesting country called New Zealand, which is also where I'm from. Lecture six. Now, there is no lecture six, but lecture six is called either <coughs> now for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. <coughs> Another good name for it would be actually now Camp Rules or I Can, You Can, We Can, Cat Plan. Okay? <laughs> lecture six is actually the sort of talk I'm giving in the RAIN workshop after this conference is over. And it will be sort of pitched in a sort of way so that the natural follow on to what I'm telling you here. So if you're interested in that, and in case some of you haven't guessed, this is something to do with indexicality. Okay? Uh, so, on the course website, I told you the kinds of things that I would like to talk about in this course. And pretty much I'm covering everything I mentioned in that, except for higher order issues. This is something that we're working on a lot at the moment, and that's probably just going to fall between the cracks. But I may find time to say something about higher order logics. Let me start telling you about modal logic. But I don't want to tell you about modal logic in the usual sort of story that you get. I want to tell you about modal logic from what's called the Amsterdam perspective. Okay. Um, I want to tell you about modal logic from uh, the Amsterdam. Ah, oh, sorry. Let me start again. I'm sorry. What is modal logic? Okay. Here's three slogans which I think summarize up what's called the Amsterdam perspective on modal logic. Okay. So, modal languages are simple yet expressive languages for talking about relational structures. That's a really, 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 really good slogan, except for one thing. If only I'd written it more punchy and say, modal languages are simple yet expressive languages for talking about graphs. Because if I'd said that, I'd said what I really, really wanted to say. Okay? And in fact, almost getting you to understand the power of that first slogan and the ubiquity when it comes to applying modal logic is part of what this course is about. Okay. Second slogan. Ah, and we're going to be hearing a lot more about the second slogan today. Modal languages provide an internal, local perspective on relational structures. Graphs. Third slogan. Modal languages are not, repeat, not isolated formal systems. Maybe some of you have been taught that modal languages are these sort of very strange languages that deal with intentional phenomena using possible worlds. In fact, I must remember that when I was at the University of Philadelphia for a year, there was this very, very strong logician who had to give this introduction to logic, and he had planned this very, very difficult and very, very exciting course. He was a very, very good logician. And I said, do you do any modal logic? And he looked back and he looked a little bit scared and he said, ah, oh, no, I don't think so, you know. You have to deal with, you know, possible worlds. Thought, okay. <laughs> and I can understand that. You know, I wouldn't be doing modal logic if I had to deal with possible worlds all the time. You know, that's why I like to say they're about graphs. Let's pass that on. <laughs> now, this is what I would call the Amsterdam perspective on modal logic. <clears throat> that's what these slogans attempt to sum up. The Amsterdam perspective, that's what I'll be elaborating on. Uh, why is it called the Amsterdam Perspective? Pretty much, I would say, because of the work of Johan van Bentum and all his students and associates, who pretty much have nailed this perspective in place over the last 25 years. Now, here's a formal-looking slide, but let's just take it fairly easy through this. I should say that in this course, until at least lecture three or four, I'm talking about propositional modal logic. Okay? Not first order modal logic. Now, I guess most of you have seen what languages of propositional modal logic look like. So I just want to sort of tell you the sort of things I'm talking about. When we're working with propositional modal logic, 
We're given some collection of propositional variables, propositional symbols, constants, and we usually write them as things like P, Q, and R. But actually, when we're giving nice examples, we try to spell them out to make meaningful words. And very often, we're given a collection of modalities. And the four symbols that we work with, the language we work with, is made up of something like this. This first line is basically meant to say, hey, we've got propositional logic. <coughs> okay? That is, we've got some symbol like that for truth, and some symbol like that for false, and an arrow symbol for implies, and a symbol like this for and, and you know, this one for or, etc., etc., etc. Okay? Propositional logic, truth tables, you all know that. Okay? We've got two other things. We've got diamond symbols, and we've got box symbols, which we call, funnily enough, boxes and diamonds. Okay? With box referring to the box symbol and diamonds referring to the diamond symbol, because you know, we're quite simple-minded. Sometimes we've only got one box and one diamond, and we don't bother with indexing them in some way. We just have a simple box and the simple diamond. I'm going through these slides here in this way. I'm going to be coming back and giving you some examples for I just want to sort of give you some of the basic things. In a sense, I'm trying to under-emphasize the importance of these slides. Okay? Everybody's fairly comfortable with this? You know, roughly speaking, what languages we're dealing with? <coughs> okay. No? Here's another word you've heard. Kripke model. What is a Kripke model? Well, basically, it's uh, three elements. You've got, what do you say, a triple. We've got a set W, and it's a set of something or others. I mean, you might think of it as worlds. If you're talking, thinking in the traditional modal sense, you might think of it as epistemic states. Sometimes they're viewed as time. Sometimes they're viewed as points of time, intervals of time. They can be viewed as states in a computer system. They can be viewed as the people in this room. We'll look at an example. They can be pretty much anything you care to work with. Okay? So I can't be very precise there. It's a set. On this set, we've got a collection of binary relations. How many? Well, enough to model what we find interesting. Okay? And I put it another way, one for each modality, since the modalities are there to talk about what we find interesting. So for example, we might sort of say, let's have a Kripke model here, okay? You're all elements of W, okay? And the relation here that I'm talking about, well, let's have two relations, let's be exciting, sits in front of and sits to the left of. Okay? Kripke model. Those are the first two components, okay? Evaluation. Ah, this is where we sort of say the atomic information. You know, which one is true or false? Let's just go for male or female and sort of say, okay, give it the natural valuation. So female, female, male, etc., etc., etc. Kripke model. Got it? That's it. Ah, and please remember the other word I used, graph. Because if I drew you all here, and please accept for the state of exposition, I'm a lousy artist. I couldn't draw this picture of, well, because I had a camera. But what I would probably do is dot, 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 and I'd sort of say she's sitting next to him, he's sitting next to him, so fe female, male, male. Basically, we would have a graph representing the situation with the information appropriately distributed. Do you get what I'm saying? Okay. Good. Oh, by the way, if I didn't say about the properties that you possess, which might be the you know, color of clothes or something, the first two components, namely just you sitting in the room and the relations we find interesting, this is called a frame. I'm not actually sure if I'll be using that terminology much, but it's part of the game and I probably will slip into it without realizing I am, so I may as well kind of footnote it now. Now, here is the satisfaction definition. Here is the bit, and this is actually fundamental in logic, Maybe I'm rushing a little bit. I'm going to be slowing down soon and backtracking over all of this. But actually, on the last two slides, in a certain sense, I've done what is very, very fundamental in logic. The slide before the last, I gave you a definition of what the language was. I said, these are our symbols. This is how we put them away. I gave you syntax. I gave you a language. And languages are for talking about things. Or at least that's one of their roles. Then I said, these are the things we want to talk about. These are the graphs. And now the purpose is of this definition to say, how do we use this dinky little baby language to talk about these graphs we find interesting? Okay? And that's the purpose of this definition. Actually, most of it I think you'll find very, very straightforward. In particular, if you read down to here, that's pretty much, that's pretty much propositional logic. 
Again, think concretely. You're the people in this room. This is where we are. Okay. When is an atomic formula P, like is female, true in this model? Well, weirdly enough, it's true when the model tells you it's true. Namely, take the symbol standing for is female, evaluate at a particular female, true, evaluate it as male, false. Okay. When is a conjunction true? When is a conjunction true at a particular person? Well, when both conjuncts are true. When is a negation true at a particular person? Okay. Well, when the unnegated thing is not. Did I say that right? Sorry. When is the negation true? When the unnegated thing is not. Yes, okay. And so on and so forth. In other words, what this definition is telling you is how you evaluate formulas at a particular point in this model, at a particular person, and just breaking things down. And the thing you should really notice about this def the first five clauses is that it really is propositional logic, and in a certain sense it's local. If I take out one of these formulas that has got no diamonds and boxes, and I evaluate it, say, at you, it's kind of like we just break down all the Boolean things with these truth table-like laws until we finally get down to the atomic propositions. Where things get interesting of these two clauses. And I'm going to concentrate on the diamond clause. Because if you understand this, you understand a lot about where we're going today. What does a diamond do? And let's suppose we're looking at a diamond, something like, I don't know, diamond something or other. And we're thinking about true at the person to the left. And we evaluate here. Okay? So diamond, then some formula afterwards. That is going to be true if there is a transition to the person on your left, which is you, and that formula is true of you. Of course, that formula may contain other diamonds, and this starts branching out all over the room as the formula explores the branch, explores the, explores the little model that we've got there. So exploring the graph. Now, this is where I've really got to kind of uh, emphasize something. It may seem a little bit silly, but... Uh, Already something really important has happened in this definition. I think probably all of you are familiar with classical logic or what's sometimes called predicate logic or first order logic. And in a certain sort of sense, you know that predicate logic is also capable of talking about graph structures like this. So when we're doing predicate logic, we think about it differently. Like, it's sort of like I'm standing down here and I say, there exists an X, and X is a woman, and X is sitting next to another woman. I look over there, is this true? Or I say, for all men in the audience, they are wearing shorts. And then I look into the model and I see whether that's true. That's not what we do in modal logic. In modal logic, and this was the strange, strange, strange bit, we take this little formula... And so to speak, we jump into the model and we say, are you true there? We stick it right in the model. We're asking it to explore locally. Exploring down here, using the diamonds and boxes to move out to other worlds. A diamond being true if it's possible to find somewhere where it's true. A box being true if at all the things you can access, but the information is true. This idea of being able to jump into the model and working locally it's actually the key to the bisimulation idea that I'm going to be explaining later. And um, it's, it's the driving force for many, many traditional applications. And in fact, here is one traditional application, and it's called tense logic. Yeah. I heard, actually, a little story about that, that past, present, and future walked into a really, really tough Austin bar. It was really tense. You know. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> this is a this is a language due to Arthur. This is a language due to Arthur Pryor, um, very interesting philosophical logician, and he invented a little modal language which was based around two diamonds. For the purpose of this course, I'm going to represent them as diamond F and diamond P. And diamond F basically means at some point in the future. And diamond P means roughly at some point in the past. Okay? And prior thought this was interesting. People have been working on modal logic and he had this revelation one day. He was looking at all these facts about the tense system and he said, hey, 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 this kind of looks like modal logic. Wouldn't it be cool if we did it this way? So he spent a large part of his career 
doing it this way. So for example, for prior, you would say something like, well, uh, uh, you know, in the past, mere unconscious, that would be true at some particular time. So again, we jump in the model. We say, in the past, Mia was unconscious. If we can turn around, we can find a time in the past where she was. And if Mia unconscious would be true, if we could now, if we could look forward into the future and find a time where she's conscious, where she's unconscious in the future. Okay? So he thought they were very, very nice representations for natural language. And the important thing for him was precisely the sense of locality that such representations gave you. So instead of thinking about time from the outside, he was insisting that really to understand about the way we reason about time and language was to take that situated view, that contextualized view. We are at some time, we live at that time, and we tend to relate what's happening to us around the deictic center that we're inhabiting. And he thought this was a nice notation for doing this. By the way, just in case I hear any linguists starting to tremble as I'm sort of saying these things, I'm sort of setting this up slightly as a straw. I'm setting these examples up here as a kind of a paper tiger, since when I sort of open the wall with hybrid logic, I'm going to be showing you exactly why these examples are not particularly rich or particularly good, and why you need something like hybrid logic to make them a little less bad. Okay? Now, <coughs> does anybody remember feature structures? Okay. Now, I've told you that modal language are these sort of simple languages for talking about graphs. And if you're in the Amsterdam school, you'll, um, if you've been listening to people like Johan van Bentham, you'll come away with this very strong sense that modal logics can be used for just about anything. <coughs> and you know, the argument is pretty much, well, they can be used for just about anything. That makes them very, very interesting. But you can actually say a little bit more than that. Another interesting historical fact about modal languages is that they've been accidentally reinvented without people realizing that they were working with modal logics. And that this has happened several times in the past. Now, do people know here, remember what the sort of attribute value notation was used for? This would be used for describing, I guess this would probably be describing some sort of pronoun. It's meant to be sort of the idea of using some, a fairly rich sort of um, rich system of uh, attributes and values. So some pronoun, you might sort of say, well, it's got two basic properties. It's got an agreement property, it's got a case property, person value is first, the number value is singular, and it's not dative. Okay? Okay. Actually, if you look at it, you might say that this has been doing exactly the same work in this modal formula. You are saying, look, I'm thinking about the structure hidden in this object. And I'm basically saying, look, it's a structured object like this. I can make an agreement transition. And if I make an agreement transition, I get to another point in the graph, and there I see first-person information and number singular information. And also I can make a case transition to where I see the information not dative. So arguably, you could say, this, this attribute value matrix notation was a two-dimensional reinvention of the basic modal <coughs> formalism. Okay? Here's another even nicer example. Okay? There's a branch of logic called description logic, which is very, very widely used nowadays because it's used for representing actually pretty much what I was doing before about the people in this classroom, the relationships that held among them. That's exactly the sort of thing that description logics are used for, describing graph-like entities about this. It's used on the World Wide Web all the time now. You talk about owl ontologies for building, say, medical ontologies, all sorts of things where you're describing relationships among different classes of things, relationships among individuals, and you want to be able to reason about them. Now, if you go to, say, one of the standard description logics, you'll find out that you're able to write down descriptions like this, that here, killer and employer gangster, which are basically are being used to describe some person who actually is a killer, and if you look out who employs him, He's employed by a gangster, so this is not the sort of person you want to meet in a dark alley. My point, though, is merely that this is essentially a modal formula. Killer, and if you look up the information by making a transition along the employer link, you find out that that person is a gangster. Does that seem kind of okay so far? My, my point here is not a particularly deep one. It's just that modal logicians say, hey, modal logic is great for just about everything. And here we're sort of saying, look, these, both these guys, the description logicians and the feature logicians, actually reinvented it without 
being aware of the fact. In fact, there's a very, very famous article in the description logic literature in which somebody in the description logic literature sort of says, hey guys, we've been doing modal logic all along. And it's quite well known. It's a paper from 1990. Okay. Now here comes a very important point. I try to tell you that talking about graphs from the point of view of modal logic is an interesting thing. As, I, as I've already tried to indicate, okay, you've got lots of ways of talking about graphs. Okay. Sorry. Um, I gave you this. I said, look, in the future, Mia will be unconscious. And I said, that's a nice <coughs> representation. That's what Arthur Pryor argued we should sort of talk about the future tense with. But I think everybody in the room will realize that there's another way of describing that same situation. Okay. You might say something like, this is a longer representation, but you might want to say something like, look, there is some t. And oh, here's a free variable, t0. t comes later than t0, so somehow this less than is corresponding to this f. And mia is unconscious at that time t. Now, do you remember what I said, what was really important in modal logic? I take something like this. F me are unconscious, so I carry it around in my hands, and I go to the model, and I say, put it in the model at that time. Is it true in the future that me is unconscious? Move back in time. Is it, is it still true? Move forward in time. Is it still true? I emphasized how when you evaluate modal formulas, you dive into the model at a time or a person and evaluate there. Okay? But look at this. This is doing pretty much the same job. Okay? It's a bit longer and all this, but look, there's a free variable there. And if you do classical logic, you'll know that a free variable is basically something that you need to stipulate using the context, you know? Well, if t0 is that, is it true there's a later time when me is unconscious? It's doing the same job, right? And what about this? Killer, an employer is a gangster. Well, maybe the description logic logicians like writing it like that, but they could have written it like this, that there is some x, and x is a killer, there's also some y, and x is employed by y, and y is a gangster. You could do it like that. And in fact, one of the basic results in modal logic is that, well, I've given you this modal language, or in fact lots and lots of modal languages, but in fact we don't have to use them at all because anything you can say in a modal language, I can say in a classical language of quantification. And there's this very, very obvious translation called the Stan <coughs> translation, which shows how to do it. Instead of saying that a propositional, instead of saying that a propositional variable p, like being female, is saying true at this node or false at this node, okay, I can do this translation. I just sort of say the node x has the property p, like being male or being female. In other words, I've gone from a propositional variable to this two-place classical thing. The rest is pretty simple. So when you translate a not phi, you just, well, keep the not, and you keep translating what's underneath. To translate a conjunction, well, you just translate each conjunction and put them together. And hey, how do we deal with the so-called specifically modal, the really interesting part of the language, say the diamonds? Well, if I can make a diamond transition along the relation R to where phi is true, it's just basically saying, hey, there's a point in the model Y. And I'm at x, but I can get to y. And when I get to y, I find that phi is true there. No muss, no fuss. Work in modal logic, work in classical logic. Who cares? Translate. So that's the end of the course, since we now know that we don't have any more work to do. And you know, we could have done it all in classical logic. And I'm sorry for wasting your time and having dragged you here to Austin, Texas. I do hope you appreciate the other courses, all right? I'm sure they'll be much longer. But wait, wait. Maybe there's something more that can be said. Oh, and I should have mentioned that actually this translation is a good translation in the sense that if a formula is stuck in a model at a point W and we see that it's true there, we could equally well have translated it and instead of sticking it in the model at a particular point, we just give the value of that point to the free variable and it comes out true. Is that okay? Is everybody with me? So this raises a little question, you know, basically why bother with modal logic? And aren't we even sort of better off with first order logic? I mean, we know a lot about first order logic. And in a sense, this is where the course begins to kick in. 
Here's some reasons for going modal. The first thing is the modal notation is pretty simple. Now, maybe that's a good reason, or maybe it's not. Okay? I don't think it's a deep, deep, deep reason, or maybe it's a reason that's so deep that the depth only starts hitting you when you work with the languages a bit. Okay? Sometimes, for some problems, it just feels true that it's good to have a description that somehow fits what you're trying to describe. And sometimes modal languages just feel good. Now, I'm not trying to sort of say this is a really deep argument, but it's a pretty good one. Okay? And there is something slightly more technical you could say here. And it's roughly speaking that the use of these operators, as you can see from the translation, it's essentially a way of avoiding having to use explicit quantifiers and explicit variables. It's a way of doing some kind of restricted quantification over accessible points okay, and not having to bind variables to give the syntactic simplicity down. OK, cool. One reason. Here's another reason. Computability. Not something I'll be following up in this course much, but you should know about it. The blunt fact about, modal, about first order logic, predicate logic, is that when you can use predicate logic to reason about arbitrary graphs, like in the people in this room and the next door that is next to and that is in front of relation, you can use modal logic for reasoning about that, uh, first order logic for reasoning about that. But in general, the reasoning can be complex and it's undecidable, that is, uncomputable. Okay, it's very, very complex. <coughs> if, on the other hand, I choose to reason with the modal language about this, I get decidability. Everything is calculable, everything is effective. You have algorithms which do it. Okay? That's one difference. And a lot of modal logicians attach a lot of importance to this. But that's not where I want to go with this today. I want to come back to this internal perspective thing. I mean, I really love this internal perspective thing. I think this is the key to understanding modal logic. The idea that you got the model there, and instead of taking this God's eye view where you're evaluating quantifiers, you, so to speak, hug the formula to you. Or if you like, you think about the formula as a little animal that you've put inside the Kripke model at a certain point, and you say, go there, okay? And its job is to explore, working out locally using the diamonds and the boxes, okay? A little modal automata or a little modal animal that's the way you've got to think about it. And the point I'm going to try and make now, because I'm going to start to tell you about high simulations, is that's not a metaphor. It's the key to modal model theory. Okay? Let's take a little closer look. What's... Oh, there's a little thing. By simulations have actually come out. By simulations basically were isolated by Johann von Bentham. He sort of generalized some earlier ideas from uh, modal logic, but he was the one who gave the first nice definition of what a bi-simulation was. It's been kind of interesting that ever since then, other people in other fields have been sort of rediscovering them. Like, uh, for example, there was non-well-founded set theory, where they, instead of using, uh, where the key notion was a bi-simulation between two of these kind of sets, we recently discovered, or we discovered a few years back, that actually there's some thing as social network theory and economics and political theory where you're trying to compare two organizations' management structure. And you don't want to say they're the same or isomorphic photocopies of each other, but somehow they bear a relationship. And computer scientists here, or at least theoretical computer scientists here, will know that if you're talking about two processes from the outside, i.e. you're not allowed to see how they actually work, but you're looking at them as two black boxes, judging them on input-output behavior, you're basically talking about by simulations. Okay? Fine. Here's the bisimulation definition. I'm going to leave it up there because I would like to look at an example. What is a bisimulation? And I really want you to think about that little modal animal, okay? Because he's a very, very nice little animal, okay? But not the brightest of animals. Right? Now, here are two little models, aka graphs, okay? So here's my model one. And it so happens that P is true there. And here is my model 2. Okay. So basically, in this model, you've got three points. And P is true here, and P is true here. Okay. And here is my little modal animal. Okay. This is diamond P. And because it's a happy little modal animal, <laughs> he's got a happy face. All right. 
And what I did is I took this little modal animal and I put it here. And I said, well, what do you think? He liked it. No. Diamond P. Ooh, can I find a transition where I make the transition, I find a P is true. And de -de 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 -de. oh, yes! I, honestly, it's breaking its happened. Now, unfortunately, what I did is I then sneaked down, I put a little blindfold on and while he was celebrating, I whisked him over to there and just saw what happened. I sort of think, ha, 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 he's going to get a shock. Imagine my surprise. He couldn't tell the difference. I mean, to me, it was so obvious. Look, two nodes, three nodes, but stupid here. Stupid here didn't see the difference. First, he was going, oh no, it's exactly the same. Look, look, here I am. Yes, I can make a transition to a P. Well, look, there, there, there. It was no good by saying to him, those are two different words. He just says, what? All I know is about making transitions to states bearing information. What's this counting thing you're talking about? I don't know anything about that. By simulation, being a little bit more precise in the definition here. These models are bisimilar because this is the bisimulation relation. So this point is bisimilar to these two points. And this point is bisimilar to these two points. And what makes this as a bisimulation is the bisimilar point, first of all, agree on atomic information. This point is bisimilar to this point. I haven't made, let anything be true here. They agree about the atomic facts. These two points are bisimilar to this point, and they all make P true. And now the crucial point for every transition in the first model, there is a matching transition in the second model that is something that takes you to the same state, marked with the same information. And also for every possible transition here, is matched by a transition to a bisimilar state here. Okay? And the basic fact about modal logic is modal animals can't tell the difference between bisimilar models. You've got bisimilar models, maybe they're really, really different. Put them at bisimilar points, they don't know it. Let me show you an even more exciting example. This is the natural numbers. Okay, I'm not going to draw the numbers here, but as you know, it's pretty big, and if I try to draw all of them, we'd be here rather a long time. So I'll just go dot, dot, dot. But think of this as zero, and one, and two, and three. So that's model one. And just for the hell of it, let's have that Q is true at all of these points here. Okay? Now, where's my other model? Here's my other model. It's got one single node. It sees itself, it makes this reflexive loop, and Q is true here. And again, oops, diamond Q. Okay. I put my little model in here, my, my little formula in here, my little creature in here. So happy. Diamond Q, diamond Q. I can keep on making transitions and seeing Qs. And I took him out of this ridiculous little finite world and I put him in here. I'd say, put him here. He didn't see the difference. But just as far as he was concerned, diamond Q, diamond Q, I can see moving up to Q. Doesn't see the difference. For us, it's infinite versus finite, no difference. Turn it on its head. In a certain sense, from a modal perspective, all the information in that large, unwieldy model has been boiled down to a very, very simple representation. And it's these kind of simple representations that modal logics love. Do you see what I mean? This is, by the way, if we're talking about complexity or all this, this would be a theme I would just hammer home till kingdom come. Logic is about the interaction, is about when you've got some kind of syntax for talking about some kind of semantics you like. Very model theoretic view, that's the way I like to think about it. If you increase your syntax, if you can say a lot about your models, if you can destroy the complete works of Shakespeare about your models, that's probably very, very nice for producing the complete works of Shakespeare, but probably you're going to have very, very poor computational properties. Sometimes it's better to be a little bit modest and only give yourself a weak language that only sees certain things or sees them up to certain limits. In this case, the limit being by simulation. Because in that case, often you get something that is more tractable and that often is ignoring inessential stuff. That's the intuition. Okay? So far, so good. Okay? <coughs> Let me say one more thing. What time is this, by the way? Let me say one more thing. Okay? I'm going to go on with this.
But it's a beautiful result, and I'm not going to even attempt to prove it, but it's a very, very beautiful result. I think it's one of the most beautiful results in modal logic. It's the Van Bentham characterization theorem. Let me just tell you what this says. Just to recap, where's the state of play? We've got our modal languages here, which we can use to talk about graphs. And we've got the first order language, which we can translate into, and which we can also use for talking about graphs. Which is better? Who cares? I think that's a silly sort of question. It depends what you want to do. How are they related? Van Benton asked a very, very nice question. He said, OK, we know that we can translate modal formulas into these first order formulas using the standard translation. Ah. And it was also clear that there's lots of stuff you can say in first order logic that you can't say in the modal language. The question he asked is, well, OK, but what bit of first order logic do we get? This modal notation is clearly a bit of first order logic, but what do we get? And the answer is very nice. Basically, you're getting exactly that bit, exactly that part of first order formula <coughs> which doesn't see the difference between bisimilar models. Right, to come back to our models here, I can write down a formula in first order logic that sees the difference between these two. Okay? Because that one has two nodes, that one has three. I can do that in first order logic. Ha! Huh. Even simpler here, look. I can write down in first order logic the, the, the expression for all x, r, x, x. For all x, r is related to itself. Okay. That's true in that model, and it's false in that model. Okay. First order logic sees the difference, all right. I mean, first order logic ain't stupid. You know, ain't no little modal animal. Okay. But, okay, Van Benson's result shows that the modal language really is this nice little fragment, and if you look at the part that it translates into the bit of first order logic it carves out, it's precisely the bit that's invariant under by simulation. Precisely. Not a bit more, not a bit less. Exactly. Okay? So it's an exact measure of the expressive power of modal languages. Okay, now it's time for a break in the sense, not a break that you stay in your seats. I didn't mean that kind of break, but it's time for a change. That was the modal logician that was speaking. I'm going to kick him off the stage because he doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm a hard-nosed hybrid logician. I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't have listened to that earlier version of Patrick Blackburn who was telling you how wonderful modal logic was because he was just wrong, all right? And it's not the first time, by the way. Okay, I've, worked, I've worked with him before. Okay. Look, think about it, guys. Think about it, guys. Look at the syntax of modal logic. Look at the semantics, okay? Now, let's do this really slow because you know, that guy's a bit stupid. What are we talking about when we talk about graphs? Duh, we're talking about the transitions, the way the points in the graph are linked, yeah? And we're talking about the points. Now, when I look at a modal language, I say, okay, you've got the transitions in the graph covered, I'll give you that. What about the nodes? What if I want to say, this thing happened then? Or what if I want to say, at node Peter's printer, I'm getting this stupid message, machine jammed or something like that. How can I do that? You know, I mean, it's just not seeing the nodes, okay? There's no way I can name a node and say this happened then or there or anything like that. It's completely insane, okay? Let's go to this alleged example of temporal logic, which Pryor laughingly said was a good way of thinking about it. Well, for a start, go to artificial intelligence, and there you will see formalisms that are built around the notion of temporal reference. Holds some piece of information at a point of time or an interval of time. That's what you do. Okay, then you find out how the points of time are related. No points here, just these stupid modalities. Okay? Oh, and let's now come and let's look at prior treatment of the past tense. Vincent accidentally squeezed the trigger does not mean that at some completely unspecified past time, past, past time, Vincent squeezed the trigger. It's not an unrestricted quantification over the past. It's actually saying that there is a past specific time contextually determined at which Yada, yada, yada. Okay? Vincent accidentally squeezed the trigger, etc. Okay. Now, this is even more obvious if you look at tense and text. So, Vincent woke up. Something felt very wrong. Vincent reached under his pillow for his Uzi. Now, okay, it doesn't really matter too much. Points, intervals, it doesn't make too much difference for hybrid logic. But if you're thinking in terms of points, it's going to be something like this. There's a point of time in the past, there's a Vincent waking up. There's another point of time in the past, if you're thinking of... Per if you're thinking uh, in terms of points, the exact same point 
if you're thinking of intervals, probably overlapping like this. And let's just something feel very wrong for Vincent time. And then Vincent reaches under his pillow for an Uzi, a sense that things have moved on a little bit. So we've got three points of time, two points identical, and one after the first two where the things narrated they happened. We referred to three points of time. There's just no way to deal with it in prior real logic, okay? End of story, okay? I think I missed a slide here. You were meant to get here a slide show. Never mind, never mind. Never mind. Doesn't matter. Okay. Feature logic. I proudly told you Nick modal logicians exhibit a feature logic is just modal logic. Ah, uh, yes, guys. Do you remember this bit about feature logic, the re-entrancy thing in which you say that node that you get to here has to be the same as that node? How did you name that node? It ain't modal logic. Can't do it. Oh, let's come to description logic. This is my favorite. Do you remember those nice modal logicians who told you, you see, they're just borrowing your notation and you know, doing it a little bit differently, but you know, we write it with wedges and that's much cooler. Okay. Well, unfortunately, most description logicians that I have met are very, very clever people. And they, when they use description logic, they use it to reason about individuals. They write down all these descriptions, and then they write down things like, Mia is in fact beautiful. And Jules and Vincent are in fact friends, and they reason about these individuals because, let's face it, you probably want to. Okay. And they do do this. And again, okay, I'm afraid, so I'm sorry, I don't have a name for any of you in the remote language. You are sitting there so nicely in the model, one in front of the other, one to the left. Ah, but you're all just nameless individuals. It's sad. Okay. It's been reduced to such a state as an in a logic class too, isn't that? <laughs> How could it get worse? Okay. At last, we turn to hybrid logic. Thank you for putting up with me. Okay. The <coughs> ambition, roughly speaking, or at least the first ambition, is that hybrid logic, the first idea behind it, is that actually we would basically like to be able to reason about graphs, to identify places in graphs, to identify nodes, to reason about their equality and to do so in a way that doesn't completely destroy what we had before when we had modal languages. That's basically the starting point, yeah, and that's what we're going to do. Now, there's different ways of expanding a logic. You might have a nice little logic like this, and you think, oh god, that's cute, and I can't do something or other. And you think, I know what I'll do, I'll bring along this great big machine here, and clunk, I'll put it over, and... No, as I said, let's try and be gentle, let's try and be sensitive, let's try and be subtle, and in fact, let's just use an idea that goes back to Arthur Pryor. <coughs> and we're going to make two changes, but the first one is the more fundamental, and it's so delicate, almost seeming ridiculous, that it's hardly worth mentioning. We're going to sort the atomic symbols, by which I simply mean that up till now, the atomic information has been of one kind. You know, we've got the P's and the Q's and the R's, and I've thought of it as things like, is male, is female, is raining, uh, is blue, whatever, okay, properties like that. We're going to have, um, we're going to have two sorts of atomic symbols. <coughs> we've got the P's, Q's, and R's, but we're also going to have the thing that we call nominals, which we usually write as I, J, and K. And the point about nominals, as the name suggests, nominals name. But please note, they are just formulas. They are things that can be true or false. They name by being true. Because the thing is that we insist that when we interpret a nominal, and for now, think of a nominal as maybe a constant, something like Mia or Vincent. We just say that whenever in any model, it's basically got to be true at exactly one node. So I don't know what your name is, but would you, could you tell me your name, please, at the back there? The yes, SU. <laughs> Bill. <coughs> Bill. So I know that you're used to having a name, Bill, where Bill is a term and all this, and I've got some distressing news for you that in the setting, Bill is now a proposition true at one point of the graph like this, okay? And that proposition, Bill is naming you by being true there and no one else in the room. Please, any other Bills, keep your hands down, all right? Because <laughs> it would be terrible to destroy. Are, are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay, that's good. It, it was completely painless, right? Uh, more or less, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Satisfied customer number one. Okay, good. <laughs> now, basically we can mix up these kind of informations. Like, look at this formula. Here we've got diamond I and P, and diamond I and Q implies diamond P and Q. The only thing I want you to observe syntactically is that, look, P, Q, P, Q, these are the ordinary atomic information. Here we've got the I, which is a nominal. But no, we're just freely mixing the nominals in, okay? Just atomic information, just formulas, okay? There is one other thing. Oh, no, actually, no. Let's do this. 
By the way, as silly as this change looks, we've already got a strong logic. Now, can somebody tell me whether this formula is true or not? Is it possible to falsify? So this formula is making this claim. I'm here at some node in a, novel, uh, in a model. And by making a transition, I see a node where R and P are true together. And by making another transition, I see a node where R and Q are true together. Therefore, I say unto you, I see a node where P and Q are true together. Now, is that good or not? No, no it's not. Yes. Okay. Please observe, though, what happens when we put the nominal in place there. And then I say, I'm making a transition. And I see an I and P world. I make a transition and I see an I and Q world. <coughs> now the claim is, I see a P and Q world. And this time it is good because you can't keep those worlds apart because you saw the I world both time and there's only one of them. Okay? Second change to get the basic hybrid language is this. We add, and, you know, it's always like, you know, you, you sort of say, well, once you invent a nominal, it's kind of like, no, I'm not going to add this operator, I'm not going to do it, I'm not, I'm, okay, I give up. We are, okay? We're going to add the at operators. And these at operators are essentially modalities which take a nominal as a subscript. And we write things like at i phi. And I practically don't have to define the semantics for you, right? Like at i phi means, you're in a model, doesn't matter where you are, go to the point named by i, and there is one, because a nominal name is a unique point in every model. And what do you do when you go to the point named I? You see where the fire is true there. Okay? Now, the nice thing about this lecture is that I can now skip lots of slides. Because that's the syntax slide which you can study to your heart's content. But all you really need to say is, new kind of atomic formula, and we've got these atti things. Okay? The rest is nonsense. Okay? But very well latent nonsense. So I trust you'll agree. Okay? Semantics. Here it is very, very beautiful, but actually all we really need to observe is that nominals are true at one point in any model. Okay? And here's actually writing down the truth definition, and look, in fact, we don't even really change this. We just say a piece of atomic information is true at some node in a model if in fact that node, if in fact the valuation says that, that you know, that's where the information is true. The point is that if it's a nominal, and you're evaluating at the right person, like if I'm evaluating Bill at the Bill node, it's going to be true, and if I'm evaluating Bill at, let's say, the Mia node or the Vincent node, no. Okay. And here, this is just thing, at i phi, you go to the world named i, and you evaluate phi there. There was a question? Yes, so you now put a constraint on the evaluation function that it must... Exactly. That's it. You just, I mean, you sort of say, we've got two kinds of things in our language. We've got ordinary information, Interpret them how you like. You know, blue, these ones are blue, these ones are blue, who cares? But there's a constraint on how you interpret nominals. They've got to be singletons. Okay. Now, things are a little bit better now. Okay. For a start, now we can handle the natural language to make these examples a little bit more convincingly. So instead of, in the past, Vincent accidentally squeezed the trigger, we get representations like, in the past, there is some point I, and at that point, we got Vincent accidentally squeezed the trigger. Maybe not the most convincing example, so let's dig a little deeper. Here's Hans Reichenbach's way of dealing with tense. I love this example for historical reasons, which I will go into in the last lecture. But probably the linguists in this room know that Hans Reichenbach tried to explain tense in terms of the interaction of three points. The point of, the point of speech or the utterance time where you're actually speaking, so you could sort of think about that where you start evaluating. The point where the event you're talking about actually happened, which he called the point of event. And also a somewhat mysterious reference point, but actually I don't think it is mysterious at all. The beautiful example is the clue perfect in English like, I had seen. And look at the way we do this in the model. We're evaluating this as a point and we're saying, look, in the past there is some point I, the reference point, and before that, the running took place. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this. I'll probably be coming back to the slide at various places in this because I'd like to get on with this example, okay? The Vincent example. <coughs> I want you to imagine that we're working with some kind of computational system which parses and produces some kind of Montague grammar style representations, okay? Something like that. How would we deal with this? 
Okay? Something like this probably. So chugga chugga chugga, Vincent woke up. Hey! In the past there was some point I and Vincent woke up. So we suddenly we just invented a point for where this waking up took place. Okay. And then we go on to the second sentence. Something felt very wrong. Hey! Once again, in the past, brand new nominal. In the past there was some point, J, and <coughs> something felt very wrong. But we're not finished, are we? Because now we've got an I and a J, and we really want to say that they're the same. Let's do this. Let's write at a point called J, I is true. Which, if you think about it, is just a wacky hybrid logic way of saying the point I is equal to the point J. It's kind of a modal way of dealing with equality. Mm. Cool. Okay. So chugga 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 chugga. And again our machine spits out via the magic of compositionality. Vincent reached under his pillow for his oopsie. And so we get in the past there at some point K, and Vincent reached under his pillow for his oopsie. Now <sighs> but this machine is marginally clever and it realizes that this is some kind of event verb and that the narrative has advanced a little bit. And so it then adds over here and at this new point K. I can see I in the past. In other words, it shifts the K to being located in the future. By the way, if this was interval logics, we'd sort of say the first two overlap and then the second one's moved to the future. It doesn't really make much difference, interval versus points in hybrid logic. You can do it either way. I was just keeping it simple. But do you understand that representation? Is that clear? Okay. Feature logic, I'll let me not go into that, okay? I'm Something. Yes, go on, please. So, what are we allowed to put as a uh, subscript for the app? <coughs> Only nominals. You've got these nominals, and these nominals can occur in two positions. They are atomic formula, which are true at one and exactly one point in any model. They really are like names, like <coughs> Bill example. Okay? And actually, I think this next one will make it clear. They also occur, so I would call that nominal appearing in formula position. But nominals are also used as subscripts for the at operator. And there I'd sort of say, well, they occur in operator position, let's say. That's the thing that I, I would have an at bill operator, which sort of <laughs> mean, would mean that, OK, we're evaluating properties that occur there. We'll see that on the next example. Is, a, is both a nominal and a proposition? Or? That's actually right at the heart, yes. A hybrid logic, there's various reasons for, cur for calling it that. But one reason is kind of like things that would normally be treated like as term-like are being treated by as formulas. You've blurred the distinction between terms and propositions thoroughly. I mean, that was what Pryor wanted to do and the people who subsequently reinvented it. Yes, yes. It's thoroughly hybridized. Okay. Um, now, in description logic, now we can sort of say things like Mia is beautiful, or where the description logic would say Mia beautiful, we would say at Mia, go to Mia, and evaluate for beauty, or you know, Jules, Vincent, friends, go to the person named Vincent and look to, go to the person named Jules and see whether Vincent is one of his friends. It's the basic idea for you. Okay. Now, I'm going to be making a few technical remarks here. I basically said, I mean, I've given you basically what, basi what was called basic hybrid logic, what it is, okay? Now I want to make a few remarks about it. I said, when I was being Mr. Nice modal person, I was telling you how wonderful modal logic was and what wonderful properties it had. It was decidable, had that nice little by simulation stuff, it was the sweetest little language on the world. And then nasty Mr. Hybrid Logician came out and said, yuck, we don't need your sort of language around here, you're useless. I'm going to fix you up. Now, Mr. Nasty Hybrid Person promised that he was going to be gentle, but can we trust him? <coughs> but that's the question. Okay. To put it another way, to put it more seriously, and actually there's a slight historical point here, modal logic changed a lot in the last 15 years, uh, partly under the impact of computer science, that was a huge motivation, partly under, under the impact of all the big changes that were taking place in Amsterdam. But it kind of went to from a fairly restricted domain, namely philosophy, looking at one set of questions to suddenly exploding in all sorts of directions with new ideas and new, new ideas, new languages, new applications. And actually, sometimes during this, um, sometimes during this process, you know, people were, let's say, in some sort of identity crisis about what modal logic was. 
like uh, I was working on hybrid logic back in the, back in about 1989 and 1990, and one modal logician at least was very offended at this idea of introducing nominals, and actually in a very reputable journal published the sentence, nominals have brought modal logic into disrepute. I've always been vaguely proud of this ever since. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would. <laughs> it's, yeah. Anyway, I've always, I've always found this quite touching. <laughs> 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 anyway, yeah. okay, and um, so there is something in this. I've just given you something, and I've just sort of said, okay, we do this, but what the hell have we done? What is this thing? Can we just take a quick look? Now, some of this stuff I'll be telling you more about uh, tomorrow, or rather some of these points, but I think I can make sense of most of it right here and now. Now, the first thing is, remember I said that modal logic is very, very simple. <coughs> and I think you'll have to agree that as far as syntactic simplicity is concerned, we couldn't really have been much gentler. Okay? We basically sort of said, you've got the same propositional variables as before. All we need to know at the end of the day when you parse all your way down is, is that an ordinary piece of information or is that a nominal? Okay? You know, come on. It's like we've given a feature, if you like, put it in linguistic terms, you know, plus nom, minus nom, or, you know plus ordinary, minus ordinary, okay? Nothing. <coughs> We've added a bunch of operators <coughs> at our things, but come on, we're doing modal logic. <coughs> if we can't add operators to this framework, who can? Okay? So, so far, so good. But operators. These turn out to be quite nice operators. Now, when I discuss axiom systems, I'll mention a bit, but these turn out to be normal modal operators. And just to let you know, a normal modal operator is something that works as follows. First of all, it satisfies this axiom, okay, like this, that if it's true at i, that phi implies psi, and if it's also true at i that phi is true, then it's true at i that psi is true. Now, this is called like the normality axiom or the k-axiom in modal logic. And basically, they call normal, when you've got a modal operator and it satisfies this, they call it normal because basically it means, okay, it doesn't matter if you stick a modal operator or loads and loads and loads of modal operators in something. Underneath all that, you've got the same old logic, and in particular, you still got modus ponens. Phi by psi, phi, therefore psi. That's what it's saying. Sticking on all these wacky modalities doesn't make any difference. Modus ponens are still you know, the beating heart of the system, and we're all happy. Okay? That's the first thing. The second property of modality is simply that you've got some mod modality in your language and phi comes up as a valid formula. Then you should be able to prove that, well, modality phi. So in particular, if phi is valid, that is something that can't possibly be false, we should be able to determine that, well, in that case, at i is true as well. Which is not hard, is it? Let's face it, if phi means true everywhere, to pull the inference that at i is true, well, yeah. Okay. It's a normal modal operator. Okay. Actually, they're kind of cute ones. If you think about it, they're, they're really well-behaved modal operators. At i phi is self-dual. It means exactly the same thing as not at i, not phi. Okay. Just think about it. Pretty clear? Okay. Let's push on a little bit. <coughs> Basic hybrid logic is still computable. So I've given you this thing that we put on these operators, we put on these new nominal things, we added those to a decidable system. In fact, it's a system that was quite nicely decidable. It's down in what's called P space, okay? Which means that when you're computing whether something is satisfiable, you won't have a huge space explosion. You don't need that much memory, okay? You may take a long, long, long time to compute, but you're not going to sort of run out of memory while you're doing it, okay? You might run out of time, but not memory, okay? Roughly speaking, okay? In fact, as I said, the basic modal language was p-space complete. Okay. Add the stuff I've just given you, and as will become clear, this language that I've just given you enables you to do a lot more. Okay. You're still p-space complete. Okay. What that means is, yes, you're still decidable, and basically, up to a polynomial, you're no more complex than what you were before. So to speak, you've got something for nasty thing. There is such a thing as a free lunch. Okay. Though I will also admit that Complexity results can be very, very tricky, and once you start looking at different languages, you get some pretty wacky results. But basically, it is true, I think, basically, that hybridizing the manner I've described is essentially a free lunch. 
Okay? We'll be seeing when we start losing our lunch on Wednesday. Okay? <laughs> but we haven't lost it yet. Now, is hybrid language, how can I put this? Is hybrid language also, um, is hybrid logic also uh, a nice little fragment of first order logic in the way that ordinary modal logic works? Now, remember, I gave the standard translation before. I said that propositional P translates to a predicate, you know, to say that P is true at some world X. Just the same as saying that <coughs> some individual X has the property P, and you know, etc., etc., etc. I've just added the two clauses to the standard translation that we need here. Okay, and basically, uh, the standard translation of I translates as I equals X, where X is that free variable. Think about it. I equals X. Let's say uh, Bill equals X. So I evaluate it here. I make X true here. That's not Bill. So Bill is not equal. I evaluate it. You're not Bill. Oh, please tell me you're not a Bill. All right. Okay. X equals. But I evaluate up there. X gets a such, and I get Bill equals Bill. It's true there. Okay. So it's just an equality statement. All right. <coughs> What's going on down here? Now remember with the at operator. So at I phi. Okay. What that means when you evaluate it is that you jump to another point in the model. Okay. You jump to another point in the model. You jump to the point named by I, and you evaluate phi there. This pretty much means that, well, okay, we evaluate the translation of phi, and remember, there's a free variable in there, x, and what do we do? We substitute the constant i, because now we're in first order logic, into that free variable. It's just like saying, well, evaluate it, bill, stick bill in for the free variable, and then evaluate the translation there. Is that clearish, clear, and so on? That's what's going on. And once again, okay, this is, uh, I always love the way Johan Benton writes about this. He sort of says you can prove this by induction, and then he always adds a sentence. But don't even think of doing it, okay? <laughs> because if you prove this by induction, it means you haven't really understood what's going on. Because correspondence theory merely writes down what the Kripke semantics is doing, and that you should be able to see that it's just doing the same job as the Kripke semantics. So if you really feel a need to prove this, what you really need to do is think about it some more. It's transparent. Okay? okay. Now, here's a more technical point, and there's something I may use in later lectures depending on how deep I go or may not. One of the really beautiful things about hybrid logic, because as it turns out, one of the stories that I'll be telling you a little bit about is that in all sorts of ways, hybrid logic makes logical life in the modal world very easy and very beautiful, okay? All sorts of things, okay? Like if you're, you know, like things like doing deduction, which I'll be talking about next thing. If you're logicians, you've heard of prop, you've heard of properties like interpolation, which you basically don't have in modal language, but you always get them in these hybrid languages, but not quite true. Okay. Um, this is, this slide here is a bit of a self, sort of self-indulgence. One of the questions that preoccupies me all the time is, we do get all these nice properties of hybrid languages. And as the course comes on, I'll be able to tell you more about them and explain what they are. And one of the questions that still really bugs me, and I don't really have a proper answer to all my questions, is why? Because hybrid logic is actually pretty close to modal logic, as it turns out. We haven't done that much. But we get a lot for free. This little addition we made, it's kind of like, you know, suddenly it's Christmas. And, uh, you know, there is a big difference between the 24th of September and the 25th of September. Okay, and I now understand why that works in society, but in this case, why just doing this little change makes everything so good, which it does. That's a little harder to explain. And I've only got partial explanations, but most of my explanations rest on this slide, and it may take a certain... Let me just say what a Robinson diagram is. Okay. When you're doing first-order model theory, there's this technique called Robinson diagrams which basically points out that first-order languages can really describe a model in big, big detail. And the thing is, you can kind of do this with these hybrid languages. So if you say at IP, it's kind of like saying, okay, at the node named I, P is true. Or at the node named I, P is false. It's kind of like you can sort of go around the model and sort of say, okay, true, false, true, false, true, false. You can really describe an entire model, the information distribution. Okay? 
Now that's just the information distribution, that's the valuation. But look at the other things you can say. So that was at IP, so P, you know, at I blueness, at J not blueness, and so on. But notice we can also sort of talk about whether two points are the same or not. We can say the point I is in fact the same as the point J, or the point I is distinct from the point J. So we can make these pretty really basic statements about the model. And here's the nice thing, and in fact we saw this in the Vincent and Mir example, okay, we can describe how the points are interrelated. Okay? Okay? To say that, so what does at I diamond J say? It says go to the point named I. Here I am, I. I'm standing up. Look, it says, okay, diamond J. Diamond, no, diamond, diamond. Ah, J. It basically saying, I can step from the point named I to the point named J. Okay. And of course you can, okay, so you can specify theories of state succession. To put it another way. But J might be I. Sorry? J might also be it I. It would be. In fact, you do that yeah. a lot. You're at I, I. Yeah. That means you can make a loop to yourself. Yeah, okay. Not at I, I. That means you can't. I, sorry, no, sorry. I, I said that too fast. At I, diamond I, means at I, you can loop around to yourself. At I, not diamond I, means that you can't. Okay, you can specify whether you are reflexive or non-reflexive. This is an example that comes up later. Yes. What I'm trying to say is that we're, let me, and let me emphasize it, because this is quite important. We're working in a baby language. Okay, modal logic is just a cut up from pro above propositional logic. Hybrid language isn't really even a cut above, hybrid logic isn't even really a cut above modal logic. It's kind of just this incy bincy ingredient. You know, we've had like 360 days of the year. It was 24th of December, and now we've gone 25th of December. What do you do? Okay, but it's made a difference. We're still in this very low complexity decidable framework, and we can start doing all the stuff. We can describe models in a way that you can't do in modal logic. As we see next week, we're going to get deduction. It's pretty weird. And this actually. If you go through the proofs and you learn out the fact that keeps on coming out time and time again, these proofs is we can just describe models accurately. So Robinson diagram. The point is I can sort of go around here and I can say, well, you know, at Bill, Mail, next to you, I'd get all the names in the class, I'd write them all down. I can describe you all now. Remember how before you were featureless people lost in this hopeless world of Nestle and you had no identities? You've been saved by the power of hybrid logic. So, you know. That's, that's wonderful. Okay? Now, let's move on from that. I want to ask a more, ask a more basic question. I've given you examples, and next week I'm going to tell you more about what we can, tomorrow I'm going to be telling you more about what we can do with it. But what is basic hybrid logic? And I hope some of you can predict the answer, and if you are thinking what it is, you're right. But let me just spell it out. It's coming back again to by simulations. Oh, not quite. It's coming back to by simulations with constants. Remember the by simulations where we put our little modal animals in? <coughs> oh, but if you think about that, those by simulations we were talking about, we were just talking about the transitions. None of the <coughs> nodes. None of the nodes in those graphs I was drawing when I was talking about, about when I was talking about by simulations had names. A bi-simulation with constants is simply the idea that we can have the same idea of bi-simulation, matching atomic information, matching transition, and one other thing, that if a node is named, say, Bill in one novel, they're one model, and the node is named Bill in one other, they have to be bi-similar. So basically, we extend our notion of bi-simulation Okay, so that it correctly respects the fact that nodes of the two different bisimilar models that, uh, mm -hmm. that bear the same name are in fact bisimilar. That's what we do. Okay, there is um, there is a formal definition here, and once again, it's the same as the one on the slide. By the way, I'll be putting the slides up there, and the only thing that we add to the standard definition is that. All the points named by the nominals, so these are the points named by the nominals over there, the points named by the nominals over here, the point named by I has to be related, the point named by I here, they have to be bisimilar. That's the only change. And once again, we get that under this extended notion of bisimulation, okay, 
by civil relations, respect, truth, and now comes the big result, the Van Benton characterization. Remember what I told you for modal logic? I said, what is ordinary modal logic? And I said, well, my favorite answer is the Van Benton characterization theorem. Modal logic is that fragment of classical logic which can't see the difference between bisimilar models. Do you remember I told you that? <coughs> OK, so what's hybrid logic? Nice answer. Hybrid logic is essentially that fragment of first order logic with constants and equality which can't see the difference between bisimulations where you add in the notion of constants. In other words, what we've added in adding the at and the nominals hasn't been some kind of dinky language, some horrible language. It's been exactly what's been needed to lift the modal language as being the bisimulation invariant thing to being the modal language that deals with bisimulation invariant other constants. I probably sort of said that all wrong, but I hope you get the point. It's not an arbitrary extension. If the Van Benton characterization is a good characterization <coughs> of modal logic, this is a wonderful characterization of hybrid logic. And now, I have to re reveal that like yin and yang, okay, before it was Mr. Modal and Mr. Hybrid, and now we sort of go to merge together like yin and yang, and you know, so it gets a bit spiritual at this point, so yeah. <laughs> take out the bath bag if you want, okay. Here's the point. I said at the start that for pedagogical purposes and for dramatic purposes, I would be sort of going from modal logic to hybrid logic and doing a bit of bashing along the way. The truth of the matter is simply this, that in a way it's something of a historical accident that hybrid logic needed to be invented. Okay. The history of modal logic I think is actually quite a weird one. There's lots of, I'm very interested in the topic, and there's lots and lots of questions I don't understand it, and why the, partic the decision to pick this particular syntax was used, and so on and so forth. But it is true that because of the particular historical route that was taken and the particular questions that were being asked in philosophy, for a long time there was not a perceived need for having names. This slowly started to change with the new applications and with the new disciplines and so on. But in a sense, you do very clearly see that some of these applications do demand the use of constants and equality to name and to reason. I mean, natural language is the ob obvious one. I mean, you, you do be able, need, need to be able to give the kids a name. And you do need to be able to sort of reason about equality all the time. Okay? Lots and lots of other applications where you want this. And the point is that it would have, just as it would have been silly in the early days to talk about... Okay, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit going down the loop here. Let me just back out and come back in again. When you study classical logic, it is true that you're taught about first order classical logic. And then sometimes equality is brought in a little later and you're told, hey, this is a little bit different. Equality is a logical symbol. It's a little bit more. But nobody sort of says, oh my god, you know, nobody says, oh, you're doing the course on first order logic. <gasps> Maybe later you'll do the course on first order logic with equality. Wow, that's so different, you know? <laughs> no, you just realize, you know, that equality is, you know, it's a special symbol. It's got a bit of logic, you know? what you need to make the constants work. It's kind of like that with this. I mean, in the light of this last result, you've got modal logic. Okay. Sometimes you want to be able to name <coughs> nodes. I mean, sometimes you don't. Okay. You name nodes with nominals. Okay. You can make equality assertions using at. Yeah, you're in the same fragment of classical logic. That's it. They really are the same. The difference is every bit as big and every bit as small as the difference between first order logic and first order logic with equality. And so once again, you know, we're all friends. All right? Okay, so good, good, good. Now, let me just try and uh, sum up. Basically, I was trying to tell you about the good points of orthodox modal logic. And then I was sort of trying to tell you what some of its shortcomings were. And I was trying to show you how we fix this shortcoming via hybridization and where that leads to, okay? Now, I do think that the last result I mentioned, the Van Bentham characterization theorem, which tells us that it's not an arbitrary extension we've made, but kind of like the one you would expect, okay? I think that's a very, very nice result. Okay? On the other hand, there is a certain, how can I put it, a certain banality about what I've said to you today. I mean, think of it this way. 
I told you that modal logic wasn't all that good because it couldn't refer to stuff. Okay? And I pointed out there's all sorts of situations where you want to be able to refer to stuff and reason about equality. Okay? And so I gave you a method which lets you refer to stuff. And what can I say? Pretty clearly, it's going to solve those problems where you need to refer to stuff. Okay? It's not really, you know, you know, I mean, you know, what can I say? <laughs> That's what it was designed for. What I'm hoping to start showing you tomorrow is that our little act here has unintended consequences. And this next one really was unintended. Let me just go back to the wonderful days when there was a war between modal logicians and hybrid logics. Modal deductions are a mess, a real mess. Hybrid deduction, that's really cool. OK, let's call it a day and, oh, I've got one other important announcement to make. I've been told to do this by David Beaver. You are to leave here promptly. You are not to look to the right. You are not to look to the left. You are to get your dinner, and you are to be back here at 7.30 sharp to hear the talk of Bonnie Weber. Names will be taken, and registers will be ticked, OK? At least that's what I think you're talking about. OK, so thank you, and see you tomorrow.